you so much. Thanks so much um, to Dr. Woodruff for inviting me to speak today, and thank you, Leslie and Rebecca, for that really wonderful overview. So today I'm going to make the case for unilateral oophorectomy for fertility preservation. I am a pediatric surgeon, and so this is my particular preference for pediatric patients, and we could talk about it as far as the consensus goes about whether we want to include that for all patients and maybe reasons for, uh, for and against. Um, I have no disclosures, and a brief outline, I will go over the goals of surgical tissue removal for fertility preservation, what we know about uh, oocytes, and I'll go through our own meta-analysis that we performed of surgical technique worldwide, and then talk a little bit about the porcine model that we developed for laparoscopic oophorectomy to mimic the pediatric patient, and then I'll go through uh, what I consider to be the optimal technique for pediatric girls who are undergoing uh, laparoscopic unilateral oophorectomy, and then give a few summary recommendations before our discussion. So as far as goals of uh, tissue removal, we know that it is a primary goal to remove the healthiest possible tissue. We know that this tissue will be stored long-term, especially for a pediatric patient that may be decades. We know that the live birth rate, as reported worldwide after reimplantation, and this is uh, based on the uh, New England Journal article, and then one of our colleagues yesterday spoke about uh, his own success being about 30%, 30 to 39%, I believe, after reimplantation. So that varies to 23 to 41%. Uh, we know that surgical handling of tissues in and of itself could could cause damage to things, that laparoscopic graspers, particularly with teeth, can do things like crush uh, tissue. We know that heat sources can cause burn injury. And what effect then does that have on the tissue that we're trying to remove? Uh, we know that we need precise hemostasis, and that usually means the need for some sort of heat or mechanical source to seal a vessel, and that's really important in a pediatric patient where their blood volume is less. And major bleeding from the ovarian artery could be life-threatening and for sure delay their, th their medical therapy, which is a very uh, strong reason to be careful about precise hemostasis. And again, that leads into that no delay to the start of definitive medical therapy. You can see from this photo uh, of a right ovary in a nine-year-old uh, high-risk patient with neuroblastoma that the ovary really is very small. It's about one to two centimeters cubed in a prepubertal pediatric patient. And for me, that's ha about half of the cases that we've operated on in our series of 110 have been prepubertal and our youngest patient five months. So it's really critical in these very tiny ovaries to be really precise with the tissue handling and hemostasis. Uh, what do we know about removing one ovary? Well, we know that after an oophorectomy, the remaining ovary compensates, that it is not the same thing as removing half of the fertility potential of, uh, of a person and the hormone potential. That remaining ovary can maintain the same levels of serum hormones and support transition through puberty. And we know that the remaining ovary can release uh, more eggs when it's stimulated for assisted reproductive technologies. And there uh, has been a publication from Norway that the, the and otherwise healthy women who had an oophorectomy for a non-malignant or non-oncologic reason, that they would uh, go through menopause on average about one year earlier than women who had two ovaries. We also know that oocytes are a finite resource, and we've seen a, a, a similar graphic to this several times throughout the conference, but it's really important to remember that baby girls are born with the most oocytes that they will ever have, and over our lifespan, those just uh, apatose and, uh, and or go through our menstrual cycles once we go through puberty. And so we have this huge primordial reserve, uh, which is on a 10 to the 6 logarithmic scale that will just decrease to that 10 to the 3rd level that will trigger menopause. And a young pediatric patient who might go through um, these high significant risk treatments that will impact that primordial reserve can, could potentially expect to go through menopause early. And therein is the definition of premature ovarian insufficiency. It's that early menopause, even if the ovary recovers after the therapy, but yet that person will go through menopause on average perhaps 20 years earlier than expected. And what do we do about that? Um, to look into this problem further, uh, several years ago, we decided to do a meta-analysis of all the surgical techniques. We, we intended this to be pediatric focused, but we really started to just look at surgical techniques across the board that were reported in the literature. And we um, 
used, as you can see, the keywords that are listed um, under this title uh, graphic. And we found 363 articles, and of those, 133 mentioned the specific details of operative approach. And once we removed duplicate authors, we were left with 22 articles that we could um, look into for details of operation. I am going to show part of the table. So this is 18 of the 22. It, it's a, enough detail that it goes over two different pages of the publication. So I invite you to look at that further. But I just wanted to highlight that we looked at the age. You can see here it ranges widely from 1.6 years to 43 years um, in a variety of different publications, that the number of patients was, um, in many cases, one patient as a key series, up to 246 and, and everything in between, and that the ovarian tissue harvest method um, was a wide variety of things, from unilateral oophorectomy to bilateral biopsies, bilateral hemi-oophorectomy, cortical biopsies, removing two-thirds of the ovarian cortex. So there were kind of a lot of different things described. But of the 22 papers, 13 of them uh, used unilateral oophorectomy. Uh, as far as complications, some papers didn't list any complications. Many of them had no complications. And I just point out, and I'll talk about this further on, a, on one of the other slides, that um, towards the bottom, you can see third, uh, fourth from the bottom, there was one clinically significant um, episode of bleeding, hemorrhage in a post-op uh, post patient that was a pediatric patient that really, to me, would be quite significant. And that was in a patient who had a bilateral hemi-oophorectomy. Um, and uh, so these are some graphics from some of the papers that we, um, that we reviewed. So you can see in this uh, series, we see a hemiophorectomy approach where the, um, the ovary is bisected in a transverse plane. And that then in the far right picture on your screen, uh, the surface is burned with monopolar cautery. Um, so uh, we could, we'll talk in a few minutes perhaps about what this might do to the ovary. Um, the next uh, papers that I wanted to point out had graphics that showed a, a grasper, pull, you know, holding onto that tissue tightly to remove it. And then you can see the wedge biopsy on the left of your screen in the background. That paper, you, we don't see the other ovary, but both ovaries were uh, wedged in, in that manner. And then on the right, again, you can see um, a sharp dissection with, with, uh, with bleeding and, and what that looks like. Um, Again, when reported, hemostasis was achieved with bipolar cautery, an argon beam, or a thrombin matrix that would be applied to the cut surface. And finally, there was one paper that described a staple technique, and um, that's problematic in pediatric patients because of the need for a 12 millimeter port. Those of you that do that know that that's quite a bigger size at the umbilicus. And um, simply put, you may not have the working space to manipulate a stapler in a very young child. Um, next, our group looked at how could we develop our own model of uh, laparoscopic oophorectomy in a pediatric patient and really try to mimic the precise conditions that we encounter in the operating room using the same equipment. And we were fortunate to get a grant from our faculty practice plan here at Lurie and have this Carl Stortz company loan us uh, the same equipment that I use in the operating room for the purposes of conducting the experiments. We looked at eight uh, Yucatan mini pigs that were six weeks in age, so they were all prepubertal. And um, we selected that because you can see on the left of the screen, that's um, the, the anatomy of an adult human. And we see that mesovarium, which is the space um, between, I'm not sure my pointer is going to work here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, maybe it will. Um, between the ovary and the fallopian tube. And this space is quite narrow in a pediatric patient. Um, and I'll show you some images of that later. And then in the piglet, this is the uh, actually the uterine horn, which is very long, but actually kind of mimics that fallopian tube. And then, um, and then the ovary is further out. So we were trying to get at how close could you be to the ovary itself and measure some um, markers of metabolism and folliculogenesis. So um, we set up our animal model to, uh, to create a, a surgical operating room um, and, again, mimic the conditions that we see in the operating room. So you, you can see here there's a piglet. We've insufflated the abdomen. We are doing our laparoscopic uh, visualization. And, um, and then this is meant to show 
the ovary and the fimbria and how this looks when we do a close dissection with the heat source essentially applied uh, directly against the cortex. And you can even see that sort of white area of burn. But if we were going to try to take the ovary right a very close to the cortical surface, that's what that would look like. Um, and then we did a far dissection comparison. I'll show that in a video. And then the, uh, the controls were a sharp dissection that we took uh, in an open fashion once right before sacrificing the animal. So we took the opposite ovary. And then as the um, video, let's see, I'm gonna show just a few minutes of this video. Um, and this again shows the really nice working space. It really is about the size of a two-year-old child and um, this is showing the right and left uterine horns. This is not bowel. I know it looks like bowel, but that is actually what the uterine horn is in a piglet. And um, and then you can see the ovary. And I use the width of the grasper, which is two centimeters at its stretched length, to estimate how far away to be to start the um, to start the dissection with the ultrasound energy device, which in this case was a harmonic scalpel. And um, so again, the ovary you can appreciate is the, the round structure underneath the grasper in the right hand. Um, I have a, a voiceover on this, but I'm just gonna show a few minutes of it. And you can see this is the advanced ultrasound energy device. And so I'm gonna divide the uterine horn in this case uh, the analogous structure to the fallopian tube to stay s that far away from the ovary. And then when we process this ovary, we are going to look in a comparison to the close, um, the close harvested group for these metabolic parameters. And so what we did was to take the porcine ovary, we used the Stady Riggs tissue slicer and then created uniform cortical pieces that we then cultured for four days and looked at metabolic markers, hormone production, and follicle counts. What we found, and um, uh, I'll, um, I'll briefly summarize um, this, and this, this is um, under final review for publication, so I'm hopeful that that will be available soon, but we can see that the glucose to lactate ratio, um, you can see the green bars are the controls, and the blue is the far dissection, and red is close dissection, so that far dissection was cl much closer to the normal control, but definitely still had some uh, abnormalities when tissue was procured using this heat source uh, compared to control sharp dissection. And um, as far as the estradiol, you can also see that the, that the far dissection was better than close, but still less than control. As the follicle assessments showed that there was significant difference in the follicle maturation stages between each surgical group, and we started to see in the close dissection at the four-day mark that we see more of this transitional pool and perhaps that concept of follicular burnout where, where the follicles are, are progressing through stages much faster, and, um, and that was much noticeable to us compared to the FAR and the control. So as, our, as far as our results from this study, we do feel like the porcine model at this young age mimics the laparoscopic oophorectomy in pediatric patients and the ovarian cortical tissue that is harvested using an advanced ultrasound energy device does experience altered metabolism compared to controls. We recommend far dissection at least a centimeter away from the cortical surface and if possible, two centimeters, although anatomically it's not always possible. We also uh, aim to continue this work and use this as pilot data for future studies looking at other surgical techniques and perhaps combinations of surgical techniques that we might use to secure the very best tissue for long-term freezing and then use that in, as a model of reimplantation. Um, I wanted to just touch on the concept of ovarian follicles being sensitive to the microenvironment. And many in this room are uh, much more uh, nimble in speaking about this than I am and have many of you have contributed to this work. But I have always had this concern of cutting across that cortical surface. And we know that the structure of the ovary and creating um, these niches for the follicles is really important. And so what does it do when you leave a raw surface behind, whether you uh, have hemostasis or not, and whether you use a heat source or not? Not, there's still that surface in the cortex has been disrupted. And is there then a proliferation of follicles that um, are inside the patient prior to the start of therapy, the apoptose and are lost? And I, I, I believe that there is much evidence that that probably is the case. And we'd, we're thinking about how we could study that as well. <laughs> 
Um, this is just another sch schematic of that, the compartmentalization that we know exists and that these follicles are in uh, different compartments and that when you cut across those, you sort of release them. And if you're not going to harvest all of them for future use, they're there, they will either be damaged or lost. Uh, one more graphic um, showing again. I, I like this one because it shows that rigidity of the polycystic ovary syndrome. And on the slide, uh, two previous, um, some use this concept of drilling or cutting or slicing to stimulate activation. And that's really what we're doing when we cut across it. And so we're leaving that surface where we've activated many follicles that may then be lost. Um, we also uh, are interested in what else could we do with the ovarian tissue in a pediatric patient as far as processing that tissue. Right now, we use methods that were really developed for the adult uh, female population, and we're thinking about the pediatric ovary as a different and unique structure. And I'm really speaking about a prepubertal ovary in this case. And so we are really trying not to throw anything away at all. And when we do the preparation of the, the cortical thinning for um, cryopreservation, uh, our group, Monica LaRonda and Francesca Duncan, are all collaborating with us to um, look at the what comes out into the media. What tissue pieces are there? Are there medullary pieces that could still contain cumulus oocyte complexes and um, any... Um, uh, other eggs that we could potentially mature that could be saved for that patient. And so we really want to have this concept of not losing anything and developing pediatric specific processes. But that has already shown great promise and is forthcoming work. Um, just a few uh, final comments about the pediatric ovary and pediatric specific techniques. So the approximate prepubertal size of an ovary in a very young child is two centimeters, as you can see the length by about half a centimeter in width. And um, the vessels are smaller in such a patient. There is a very narrow mesovarium between the fallopian tube and the ovary. The primordial follicle reserve, as we know, will be close to that cortical surface. And we showed that graphic of that logarithmic number that are there, even though this ovary is such a tiny size. We know that that's a finite resource, and we also know that we'll ultimately get fewer cortical strips in this patient for long-term freezing. And so we're aware of how many chances to achieve that live birth rate or perhaps hormone restoration we might have if we remove this ovary. Um, this is a brief um, uh, graphic showing port placement in a pediatric child, and I, I like to just show that uh, letter A, just showing the different shape of a very young baby and the very shallow pelvis where you just have a much more limited working space. As far as technical principles, this is a, a two and a half year old child's abdomen and I'm showing um, where I might put laparoscopic ports. Um, usually we use a three port technique and the X shows an alternative site if you put both ports on the left side of the abdomen versus um, a right upper quadrant and a left lower quadrant. You can also use a, um, a, pu a super pubic port as well. This is what a pediatric pelvis looks like. You can see the right and left ovaries that are the little yellow, um, and they're very uh, elongated, and there's that very narrow mesovarium. There's a long pedicle in a pediatric patient so that those ovaries are already kind of naturally up and out of the abdomen. Many people talk about oophoropexy, but in most cases, those ovaries are already well out of the pelvis. Uh, this is a laparoscopic grasper, and I like to grab just adjacent to the capsule and not touch the ovary cortex at all, and then stretch that so that I get as much width between the ovary and the fallopian tube as possible, and then take the um, energy device and divide right alongside the fallopian tube over, over in this area um, so that I maintain that at least one centimeter width away from this ovarian cortex. This is just a, an, an example of that. And then take the ovarian artery as the very last structure. I find that by doing this and going from medial to lateral and lifting the ovary up, we really can see the ure ureter very well. I know that was mentioned earlier. And that, that allows us to, um, to stay away from that structure. Um, and then this is putting the ovary in an endo catch bag. And then this is what the uh, surgical bed looks like at the end with the fallopian tube and um, Vimbria still there. Uh, so this is uh, the technical principles of a dissection of one centimeter away from the capsule using a no-touch technique, preservation of the adnexal structures, and division of the ovarian artery as the very last structure. <laughs>
This is, again, the size of that ovary. And the strips in the middle here are from an adult patient. We never get this many from such a small ovary. We, can, we get usually between two and four strips for this size ovary. In summary, uh, the recommendations that I would have for a pediatric patient in particular would be to maintain that dissection plane at least a centimeter away from the ovarian capsule, providing the best quality tissue without burn, crush, and um, while putting that patient under, undergoing the surgical risk for this procedure and trying to do the best we can to procure enough tissue for, for the future and not um, injure anything in the process. This, um, again, allows preservation of the maximum follicular reserve and does not increase the risk of surgical complications or injury to that cut ovarian surface. And we clearly need to continue research efforts in pediatric surgical technique and tissue processing. Thanks so much.